Judge Schroeder, viewed as a no-nonsense judge, his style described as old school and a judge who takes command of his courtroom. Justice Janine Geske served on the Wisconsin Supreme Court and most recently was a distinguished professor of law at Marquette University Law School. She also knows Judge Schroeder and she joins us live tonight. Uh, Justice, we appreciate your time. I want to talk about the judge in a moment because he has received a lot of attention in this trial. But first, I want to get your reaction uh, watching this trial play forward uh, from the sidelines as the rest of us did. Well, I think in watching at least the jury, let me talk about the jury for a moment. Um, you know, they acted at least from the outside as we a jury that we want them to be. They appeared to take the responsibility seriously. They, you know, they obviously were divided when they first went into the jury room. Um, they looked at some of the evidence again. They asked for clarification on, on getting jury instructions. When they got tired, they went home for the day, came back the next day, and ultimately reached a verdict. And so that's what we want jurors to do. Um, obviously, there is societal impact on this verdict, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, and then, of course, the personality of the judge became larger than life um, on the on the public stage. Did you expect a full acquittal? Uh, I did not. Um, I did not. I I thought that probably there would be some lesser included, um, but I can't say I'm shocked. Um, it was a very tough case for the prosecution, and um, I'm not shocked that they came back acquittals. I, I would have guessed, that, especially with the length of time they were out, that we would have seen more of a compromise verdict, and we didn't. Just goes to show we never know what's going on uh, in those deliberations. All right, let's talk about Judge Schroeder. Uh, you call him quirky, saying he marches to the beat of his own drum. He caught many's attention um, in this trial. However, there are a few things I've seen you speak on this before, and there's been a lot of criticism on some of the things that happened during this trial. One in particular, you said the decision to allow the jury to take home that packet of instructions was a bad idea. Uh, why did you feel that way? Well, you know, it's interesting because I heard today, I think the juror that took the instructions home was turned out to be the foreperson. Mm -hmm. I think to allow the jury to do anything outside the presence of the other jurors is dangerous. You know, they've taken an oath all together to consider everything, to collaborate, and to allow that to leave the courtroom, go home with that juror, with the temptation of looking something up, asking somebody, or even working on it on her own without being able to talk to the other jurors while she was doing it, I think legally was very problematic. And I, I didn't understand why he did that. Um, I think it was an error. The other center of, of discussion and focus that people have questions about is this method of the jury selection during the trial, allowing Rittenhouse to basically reach into that metal 10 and select the alternate jurors. Is too much being made Made of that part of the process? Oh, I think it is. I, you know, it's bizarre. Um, I've never seen it. I've tried many, many first degree murder cases. It's nothing I ever would have considered doing it. But I don't see that it was any harm. I mean, it was in front of everybody. The jurors names were not on the, the pieces that he took out. So there was no way he can control it. it it's just it, it it's just an odd thing to do in a courtroom. Um, there were other things that concerned me a lot more than that. Like what? Well, the, uh, you mentioned the applauding of a defense use of force expert right before he testified is concerning. It's giving weight and attention, the court's attention on a particular witness who was very important to the defense. I think that that was a serious error on the judge's part. You know, obviously his comment is his joke or whatever that was about about the Asian food and of course his ringtone going off. I mean, those things are all were all serious and you know, distracting to the jury. But what I said generally is my experience is the jury isn't paying that much attention to the judge. They're watching the defendant and the witnesses. I think it was more concerning to the public arena where people were watching this to see if it was a fair trial and to get a sense of it. And I think the reactions were very negative um, because he he took too much attention away from the trial itself. Mm -hmm. Do you believe from what you saw that it was a fair trial? I do. Mm -hmm. I do think it was a fair trial. How about I the... Oh, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say the rulings that he gave, the legal rulings and objections and things, I think were quite accurate. I mean, I can't think of any that I disagreed with. Um, even the gun charge, which has raised a lot of controversy, I think he was legally correct on that. Mm -hmm. How about the attention that uh, he gave to the media? He was clearly frustrated when some of the jurors were followed by members of the media, said he wasn't sure he would allow media or cameras in any of his future cases. Uh, does the media hurt the process being in the courtroom with cameras like that, or does it give the public insight that we wouldn't necessarily have? I'm a big believer of cameras in the courtroom, and Wisconsin was an early state to allow cameras in. So I remember in the 80s, when I was trying murder cases, we always had cameras in the courtroom. And I think it's important that the public have access to what's going on in our courts, how the judges are deciding things, what kind of instructions are given. And even with all the quirks and, and turns in this case, I think it's important that the public got to see it. Mm -hmm. I would hate to start closing the doors. I wish the U.S. Supreme Court would open up their arguments. You think they will ever will? I do. I do. I think it's, it's it will come as we get some younger justices. Um, you know, they've already got to the point that you can listen to recordings. And really, you know, there's no reason not to have cameras in the U.S. Supreme Court or in all our federal courts. So I'm hoping that'll happen. There's clearly interest, I think, in, in understanding the process and, and feeling as though you're part of it because you never know when it'll be your turn uh, to serve no. on a jury. All right, let's talk about um, this case as a whole, kind of the bigger picture, uh, Justice. This came down to self-defense and the Second Amendment. Does it have larger implications nationwide? It does, I think, and I, I am very concerned about that. As much as I think the jury did its job, I'm afraid that the message of this verdict is that it is all right for protesters and counter-protesters to appear in communities with loaded guns showing and, and what that may lead to in terms of violence during those confrontations. It's one thing when people are pushing each other or water bottles are being thrown. It's another one we have AR-15s and, and bullets being loaded into people's body. And I'm concerned that people are going to see that this is a carte blanche to do that. And so how do we stop it? How do we intervene now, know, knowing that that is the potential that we face? Well, I think there are a number of things. One, I, as I said, I thought the judge was right on dismissing the juvenile in possession of a dangerous weapon because of the way the statute was worded. It is poorly worded. It was worded, I think, to protect um, kids who were hunting and, and farm kids, but it wasn't designed to have Kyle Rittenhorse House walk into Kenosha with this gun. Um, so the legislature can fix that relatively easily and, and make it a, a crime for a juvenile to be walking around with a AR-15, even if it's a legal length. The second thing is more is more difficult. How do we how do we control? How can we have gun control that allows people to exercise their Second Amendment, but yet not introduce these guns into these volatile situations? I'm looking forward. The U.S. Supreme Court has a case that's going to be argued not too far down the road that's going to deal with the issue of states and, and local governments controlling the use of guns in public. And I think that that's an important discussion to have because uh, this is not the way that we're going to be able to resolve our conflicts. It's only going to make it more dangerous and have more people either killed. Because ultimately, we talk about all this, two young men are dead and another was severely injured, and we shouldn't forget that. Certainly not for their families tonight, and an important discussion to continue uh, moving forward. Justice Janine Geske, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.